What's going on guys? Thanks for tuning in. I'm Kalen. Be sure to smash that like button, subscribe, and share with your friends. Today's video essay is in honor of Women's History Month, and it's going to be on none other than the psychologically thrilling Toni Morrison's 1970 classic, The Bluest Eye. It's her first novel and it set the tone for nine more novels, one of which was Beloved, as you may know, it became a movie, featured Oprah and a whole bunch of other A-list celebrities. These novels were penned by her own hand. They explore the deep trauma carried around and nursed today by Black Americans caused by American racism and its legacy. So let's jump right in. Morrison writes from a deeply psychosomatic lens and has a way of enticing her readers into an eerie, chilling world. I didn't want to speak for Black people. I wanted to speak to and to be among, it's us. So the first thing I had to do was to eliminate the white gaze. Jimmy Baldwin used to talk about that. The little white man that sits on your shoulder <laughs> and checks out everything you do and say. So to knock him off and you know, you're free. Now I own the world. I mean, I can write about anything to anyone, for anyone. The feeling one gets when reading The Bluest Eye is of walking through an old abandoned mansion during the day. One sees particles of dust hovering in the beams of sunlight which pour through the windows in the house's rooms. One has no idea how they've gotten there, but viscerally feels compelled to continue exploring the presence of malice throughout the mansion. Toni Morrison's novel, the Bluest Eye is a raw, uncut portrayal of the unfortunate circumstances that Black youth have been raised under in this country, the results of slavery and racist attitudes held by Blacks towards themselves and towards whites, and of whites held towards Blacks. It is not a story of victimhood, but of how Black children, particularly Black female children, are often psychologically destroyed by American society before they have the chance to understand their innate beauty. To say the book was eye-opening is an understatement. It chronicles the lives of three black girls and their near futile struggle to cope with a world that treats them as if they are nothing but horrid stains on the beauty that is life. The book is especially keen on describing the hideous circumstances, a familiar staple in many black lives that lead to self-hatred and contempt for oneself and other black people. Morrison highlights as causal factors of black self-contempt, poverty and dehumanizing treatment by whites. The loneliness that comes as a result of illness and death caused by poor and escapable living standards and the desperation to be accepted by one's own people and the dominant society. What I found most insightful was the psychological description of Charlie, the abused child turned abusive father who rapes and impregnates his own daughter, Picola. Many school systems have banned the book, citing the scene and Morrison's detailed description of the male psychology behind rape. I'm Andrea Berkeley, and today I'd like to read a passage from my favorite banned book, The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. It was banned for depicting childhood sexual abuse. Black people who read this book and have lived similar experiences will be able to relate to how Claudia and Frida, two child sisters and friends of Bacola, are treated and expected to exist in a world of racism in traumatized black adults world which views black girls as an anathema and a grotesque mark on the beautiful portrait that is the human race. What does it mean to be beautiful? The Bluest Eye attempts to address this question. Morrison encourages us to peer deep into our own psyches using the lens of trauma to explore the way we understand beauty standards, skin color, privilege, freedom, economics, black economics, and family. A central problem with how humans relate to one another is an inability to empathize as opposed to sympathize with the other. There is no such thing as race, none. Really? There's just a human race, scientifically, mm -hmm. anthropologically. Racism is a construct. Morrison, born in 1931 and writing in 1970, was critically aware of people's incapacity for acknowledging the humanity in others, people of the same race and people of a different race. But when you take it away, I take your race away. And there you are, all strung out, and all you got is your little self. And what is that? What are you without racism? Are you any good? Are you still strong? Are you still smart? Are you still like yourself? If you can only be tall because somebody's on their knees, then you have a serious problem. And my feeling is white people have a very, very serious problem. To this end, Morrison dares to expose what society today still grossly misunderstands, that the sins of a generation are passed down and shouldered by each successive generation, 
and that they manifest as a rejection of inner beauty and the personal sabotage of youthful innocence. Black savages and the legacy of slavery. Morrison focuses on what she sees as a crippling of young black girls before the race of life. Racism set aside, black girls and black boys must deal with an all too prevalent familiar pretense at civilizing the savagery out of them. Black parents and white society teach black children that white people are inherently virtuous and naturally to be respected. And so a respectability game is played in black households. The earliest examples of racial respectability can be seen in the dynamic between slaves and their masters. Enslaved mothers and fathers didn't want to see their children beaten or killed by their slave masters. So they did the beating on behalf of the slave masters and were proud to do so. If parents could civilize the savage out of their children, they reasoned, that their children would be safe. We can't be certain that the desired effect of sparing the children from certain destruction always materialized. However, we can say that the tradition of whipping in black households has outlived American slavery. While black families do not hold the exclusive monopoly on corporal punishment on their children, the use of it to handle disciplinary matters in dysfunctional, colonized, and impoverished black communities makes its consequences that much more damaging to black youth at least potentially. Morrison, writing the perspective of the two little black girls, Claudia and Frida, uh, who grew up in the deep South, writes, quote, they beat us differently in the spring. Instead of the dull pain of a winter strap, there were these new green switches that lost their sting long after the whipping was over. There was a nervous meanness in these long twigs that made us long for the steady stroke of a strap or the firm, honest slap of a hairbrush, end quote. The acceptance of one's brutalization is worsened only by one's desire to choose the means by which they will be abused. Self-hatred, social conformity, and the Black family. The most commonly reoccurring theme throughout Morrison's book is generational trauma caused by hatred of oneself and of one's people. Much Black scholarship and literature has come about as a result of trying to diagnose the strange relationship Black people have and have had amongst themselves and with a colonizing dominant white American society. While overtly racist practices in American society lessen as time passes, the ideal still for most Blacks is that somehow they must find a way to participate in a society that views their presence as a problem. As such, they must live performative lifestyles so as to be accepted by their white counterparts. In dress, in education, speech, and culture, Black people are compelled to assimilate to the dominant culture's traditions to remain safe and considered non-threatening to power, or to stand for and embrace their own identity and ideas about how to conduct their lives within but separate from the dominant society. The latter choice has consequences which can and often do create further turmoil for Black people. The recent case of Houston, Texas high school student Daryl George highlights what happens when Black people choose to honor their own ideas about culture instead of acquiescing to the dominant culture's ideas. Daryl George, 18, has not been allowed to attend regular classes at his Barbers Hill, Houston, Texas high school, but has instead been given in-school suspension and has spent time in an off-site disciplinary program for what his school district says is not compliance with district laws regarding hair length. George has hair that he wears up above his head in dreads or locks. However, the district says that if he were to let it down, it will violate the district's length policy. The case hinges on whether or not he is protected by the Crown Act, a bill signed into law by 23 states that prevents employers and schools from discriminating against individuals based on naturally diverse hair textures and protective hairstyles, including braids, dreads, locks, bantu knots, and afros. His case is mired in legality at the moment and continues, as of this essay, to be adjudicated at the expense of Daryl George's education. This same dichotomy between indigenous and dominant cultural identity is played out in Morrison's work, most noticeably in the character of Pauline and by extension, her family. As a young naive girl from Kentucky, Pauline has innocent dreams of living romantically with a man. When she meets this man, Charlie Breedlove, her life morphs into the romantic fairy tale of her teenage dreams. She and Charlie marry and move away together to Ohio where they begin a new life. Charlie gains employment at a steel mill and Pauline keeps house. Soon, however, the two begin to grow apart as couples often do. Charlie begins drinking and Pauline begins to grow lonely. In addition to her loneliness, Pauline, a born and raised Southerner, has a difficult time getting along with Northern women who grossly remark at how unkempt and out of fashion she is. This causes Pauline to feel as if she needs new clothing and hairstyle. Charlie, often drunk, spends more time with men from work and less time with his wife. He complains that they need more money and lambasts her for buying clothes and trying to develop a sense of beauty and style. The two begin to bicker and argue. 
Pauline's husband is the quintessential troubled black male, the unfortunate victim of his circumstances. When Charlie is just four days old, his mother wraps him in two blankets and a newspaper and places him next to a junk heap by a railroad with intentions to abandon it. His aunt, Jimmy, sees this, retrieves him, and beats his mother brutally with a razor strap. She runs away, never to be seen again, and Charlie is raised by his aunt. It is unclear whether Charlie is prematurely exposed to sexual situations before he is of age by his aunt, Jimmy. We can say that he likely has some questionable experiences which might have prematurely heightened the sensitivity to women and sexuality. Morrison writes, Charlie was grateful for having been saved from his mother by his aunt, except sometimes when she made him sleep with her for warmth in winter and he could see her old, wrinkled breasts sagging in her nightgown. Later, while Charlie is dreaming, Morrison, utilizing all the advantages of third-person storytelling, writes about what Charlie experiences in his dreams. Quote, he was aware in his sleep of being curled up in a chair, his hands tucked between his thighs. In a dream, his penis changed into a long hickory stick, and the hands caressing it were the hands of Medea. End quote. Medea is an elderly woman who is known to be a healer in Charlie's community. That Charlie would have dreamed of her caressing his penis indicates that perhaps his sexual nature was a bit advanced more so than it should have been at such a young age. It is normal for young men to experience erections very young and to fantasize about women as they begin to experience puberty. Without being explicitly made aware of Charlie's age, we can't know if his proclivity was normal for his development or premature. There is some later context in which Charlie does experience some sexual situations and we're pretty sure that he's between maybe 13 and 14 years old at this point. Charlie's coming of age experience with Darlene were led to believe she is his first sexual encounter is an indication of his innocence. His discovery of male accountability and his hatred for oneself and one's people born out of group powerlessness to an oppressive force. The aunt who saved Charlie from certain death has just passed. After the wake, Charlie begins to meet family members he's never met. He's a bit older now and sexually mature enough to procreate. He meets Darlene, a girl who Morrison makes clear has an ambiguous familial relation to Charlie, along with some other cousins and funeral attendees the two head out into a field alone to play and enjoy each other's company. After some time, the two begin to get close. Their makeout session turns into sex. Unexpectedly, two white men with hunting rifles and flashlights find them in the field. Startled, Charlie rolls off of Darlene, sees the hunters and struggles to pull up his pants. The men point guns at Charlie and tell him not to pull up his pants and go home, but to continue having sex with Darlene who is in a state of shock and has mentally dissociated from the situation. Charlie, realizing he has no choice, forces himself to try. He's unable to, and in fear for his life, simply goes through the motion. Morrison writes, quote, Darlene put her hands over her face as Charlie began to simulate what had gone on before. He could do no more than make believe. Come on, coon, faster. You ain't doing nothing for her, the men yell at Charlie. Charlie, moving faster, looked at Darlene. He hated her. He almost wished he could do it hard, long, and painful. He hated her so much. He stared at Darlene's hands covering her face in the moon and lamplight. It looked like baby claws, end quote. The men eventually leave Charlie and Darlene. Morrison exposes Charlie's inner thoughts a little later. Quote, Charlie raised himself and in silence buttoned his trousers. Darlene did not move. Charlie wanted to strangle her, but instead he touched her leg with his foot and said, quote, we got to get girl. Come on, end quote. This segment speaks to many problems based in trauma black people feel intrinsically but don't or struggle to articulate in everyday conversation. Primarily, the problem of control over one's life, or rather, a lack of it, creates the perfect environment for hatred and resentment of oneself and the society one inhabits. Charlie realizes that he has no control over his own sexuality, but that white men do. As well, he is upset at Darlene, most likely because she initiated sex with him by putting her hands under his shirt and kissing him. Charlie had always experienced women in control. However, with the recent passing of his aunt Jimmy, he now, through the actions of Darlene, sees a weakness in women he'd never known while under his aunt's ages. Morrison provides Charlie's inner thoughts as he recalls the botched sexual encounter. Quote, never did he once consider directing his hatred toward the hunters. Such an emotion would have destroyed him. They were big, white, armed men. He was small, black, helpless. His subconscious knew what his conscious mind did not guess that hating them would have consumed him, burned him up like a piece of soft coal, leaving only flakes of ash and a question mark of smoke. For now, he hated the one who had created the situation, the one who bore witness to his failure, his impotence, the one he'd not been able to protect, end quote. In black communities, the stability of the familial unit has been a challenge and a pain point since the 60s when fatherlessness and out-of-wedlock births began to increase. As well, 
one can see on social media open debates regarding how black women feel about the reliability of black men and their ability to provide protection and financial security for them and a family. I genuinely want to know why black men make dating so difficult. They make it- Hi. I have an answer, and it's simply because they don't have money. Likewise, black men have expressed concern over the seeming abundance of women who are too masculine and incapable of being feminine. Black men have the idea that black women don't believe black men are able to adequately fulfill the masculine role. As a result, they are unable to trust and rely on them for protection and security. And it's uh, agencies out there that are seeking to destroy families in general Western culture, families in general, especially black families. And this is the thing, I tell women this all the time. You're not the only one that know you special. Your man or guys interested in you, not the only one that know you special. These corporations know you special too. And they wanna get these women away from their families. They wanna get these women out of the household. They want these women to be on the opposite side of the gender war because that's more money for them. That's more spending for them. So all of this talent, you know, like I think Tyshawn mentioned this in a, in a podcast, I think black female entrepreneurs are the fastest growing entrepreneurs. That's great. But let's think about what what else could that mean? Mm -hmm. What well, are they running from? What are they leaving behind when they're grow fastly growing these businesses? Exactly. And it's not say that you can't do both, but you got to think about what comes first. Would it be growing at that rapid speed if your family was taking priority or if building? In your this relational dynamic contributes to the self-hating theme throughout the book. Morrison further elaborates on that at odds nature of the male-female dynamic in the black community through Charlie's and Pauline's marriage. Pauline has two children with Charlie, a boy, Sammy, and a girl, Picola. As the children grow and as Charlie and she argue, Pauline realizes that she needs to become the stable family matron if the family is to survive. So Pauline begins to develop a kind of grumpy stoicism towards her life and the humans in it. She acquiesces to the reality of her position as a poor black woman in a white world. She develops resentment for her family and her people and finds solace in dreaming of what life would be like if she were white. In The Soul of Black Folk, W.E.B. Du Bois' landmark sociological expose, he famously discusses the idea that black people entertain sometimes consciously sometimes unwittingly, a double consciousness. On one hand, there is the distinct knowing that black people are separate and distinct from white society. The way we look, dress, act, and feel about our own existence belies a reality that appears to be understood only on the surface by the dominant society. The heart of black existence is not known, cannot be known by the dominant society. He intimates that white society is ever afraid to ask blacks outright what it feels like to be a problem. Instead, they, the whites, choose to beat around the bush, try to find common ground where there is none. The boys writes of his black friends and youth, quote, their youth shrunk in tasteless sycophancy, which is to say an unquestioning acquiescence, or into silent hatred of the pale world about them and mocking distrust of everything white, or wasted itself in a bitter cry. Why did God make me an outcast and a stranger in my own house? End quote. Taking a page from Du Bois' analysis, Morrison's Pauline chooses to become a fanatic sycophant of the white status quo, exhorting her children to do the same and her husband for not doing so. Caught between the veils of whiteness and blackness, Pauline learns to neglect her own family and longs for the lifestyle of her white employers. Quote, it was her good fortune to find a permanent job in the home of a well-to-do family whose members were affectionate, appreciative, and generous. She looked at their houses, smelled their linen, touched their silk draperies, and loved all of it. She became known as an ideal servant, for such a role filled practically all of her needs. When she bathed the little fisher girl, it was in a porcelain tub with silvery straps, running infinite quantities of hot, clear water. She dried her in fluffy white towels and put her in cuddly night clothes. Then she brushed the yellow hair, enjoying the roll and slip of it between her fingers. No zinc tub, no buckets of stove heated water, no flaky, stiff, grayish towels washed in the kitchen sink, dried in the dusty backyard, no tangled black puffs of rough wool to comb, end quote. Morrison writes of Pauline, mother of two, the wife of Charlie, former carefree dreamer, and now jaded judgmental homekeeper, quote, them, Pauline's children, she bent towards respectability, and in so doing taught them fear, fear of being clumsy, Fear of being like their father, fear of not being loved by God, fear of madness, read 
mental illness, like Charlie's mother's. If you remember, Charlie's mother left him in a heap of junk next to a railroad, and that's why uh, we assume from the story that she had a mental illness. And to her son, she beat a loud desire to run away. And then to her daughter, she beat a fear of growing up, fear of other people, fear of life, end quote. The same familial dynamics rooted in post-slavery trauma exist today and are perhaps responsible for the heavily strained relationships in not all, but many Black families. Black sexuality and the false virtue of Eurocentric beauty. Beauty is a huge theme in the book. Pauline's troubles with Charlie lead her to begin to find solace in films. While in movie theaters, Pauline is able to forget her marital problems and dream of earlier days before she was married. She could go back to imagining what romantic love might look like. Morrison, commenting on how false notions of beauty poison the human mind, writes of Pauline, quote, there in the dark, her memory was refreshed and she succumbed to her earlier dreams. Along with the idea of romantic love, she was introduced to another, physical beauty, probably the most destructive ideas in the history of human thought. Both originated in envy, thrived in insecurity, and ended in delusion. In equating physical beauty with virtue, Pauline stripped her mind, bound it, and collected self-contempt by the heat. She forgot lust and simple caring for. She regarded love as possessive mating and romance as the goal of the spirit. It would be for her a wellspring from which she would draw the most destructive emotions, deceiving the lover and seeking to imprison the beloved, curtailing freedom in every way. She was never able, after her education in the movies, to look at a face and not assign it some category in the scale of absolute beauty and the scale was one she absorbed in full from the silver screen." End quote. Black women today, it might be argued, have an uncommon fixation with beauty, particularly white Eurocentric ideas around beauty. Are you really pretty or do you just look white? Well, today I'm here to talk about pretty privilege and how it upholds the European beauty standards and how this might be an issue more than we think. Humans are social creatures and depend ultimately on each other for sustenance and validation. However, this dependence becomes unhealthy when one is unable to find self-worth in themselves without external validation. One of the ways in which women in general find social validation is from their aesthetic qualities. To be considered beautiful is a major leg up in just about every social realm. If a white woman is not considered traditionally beautiful, she may still rely upon the fact that she is white for some measure of self-esteem and social value. Remember that white and even light skin has been historically associated with virtue and desirability in the West. However, if a black woman cannot acquire social acceptance for her beauty, then unable to find enough commonality with the dominant culture, she may become mentally disturbed and may turn to any number of unhealthy outlets of expression to prove herself worthy of validation. This could include sexual promiscuity, aggressive behavior, criminal activity, as defined by the dominant culture's social order, etc. Of course, these are all generalized effects of social rejection or neglect. A lack of social validation could just as well manifest in one, a desire to achieve academically, in sport, or in some other field. We should acknowledge the darker side of beauty for balance and clarity. When a woman's beauty is noticed at a young age and she is overly rewarded for it by society, she may feel the desire to accentuate and promote it as the most important quality she possesses. Intelligence, domestic capabilities, and amicable nature, etc. may be pushed to the rear as she chooses to find ever more ways to prove how beautiful she is. This may lead, ironically, to the same effects that social rejection has, i.e. sexual promiscuity, aggressive behavior, and criminal activity. It appears that women, particularly black women, require first the understanding that they are beautiful in and of themselves, no matter what they look like. And second, a non-judgmental safe connection with their father, mother, and extended family. If neither their father, mother, nor extended family are able to provide proper validation due to their own trauma, it is likely that unfortunately, a black woman will have to do much work to find a sense of inner beauty and worthiness and to create a life where they can thrive despite social and familial rejection. Morrison's gross dysfunctionality around the black family and black beauty standards culminates in the rape of Piccola by her father, Charlie. Charlie, void of a mother and brutally rejected by his father at 14, was a ticking time bomb. He'd never known what it meant to be a mature male. He'd never been given responsibility, had no role model for success or personal growth, had discovered sexual promiscuity at an early age, and had become an alcoholic. All of this leads up to the scene where he rapes his 11-year-old daughter. Morrison describes Charlie as experiencing revulsion, guilt, pity, and then love as he looked upon Piccola, alone washing dishes, 
from the entrance of the kitchen in a drunken state. Morrison discusses Charlie's state in detail, noting that he feels incapable of offering Piccolo the life she deserves as a father and that her innocence and vulnerability anger him. Quote, guilt and innocence rose into a bilious duet. What could he do for her, ever? What could he give her, say to her? What could a burned out black man say to the hunched back of his 11 year old daughter? If he looked into her face, he would see those haunted loving eyes. The hauntedness would irritate him. The love would move him to fury. How dare she love him? Hadn't she any sense at all? End quote. Perhaps Charlie provides a good example of what men feel when they force themselves onto innocent and unsuspecting defenseless women and girls. Perhaps there is at once a deep sense of self-hatred and loathing, while at the same time an affection, a tenderness, or a desire for the victim to reciprocate those feelings. Heinous as this scene is, Morrison does a masterful job at exploring the internal workings of the male mind as it relates to sexual deviance. And this is why I chose to make her the subject of this essay for Women's History Month. I urge all who have made it to the end of this video to contemplate your relationship with yourself and with others, particularly the women in your life. Where do you derive your sense of self? How do others affect the way you think of yourself? How are you affected by the traditions, customs, and social norms of dominant society? Are you a beneficiary of privilege? If so, how? Remember that we as members of the human race have a duty to take for granted nothing as regards our relation to ourselves and those we share the planet with. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Happy Women's History Month, and I will see you guys next time. Peace.